victim was on the floor in the in on a street inside the apartment complex. Again, police are just putting the pieces of this puzzle together. Not sure if they're looking for one shooter or possibly shooters in this case, but as developments continue, they hope to learn more and possibly go after the person who pulled the trigger. That is the latest from here. Ben Correa, back to you in the studio. All right, Ben, thank you for the update. Some of the busiest roadways in Las Vegas were shut down for the entire afternoon today as the bomb squad and hazmat teams moved in on a mysterious metal drum. The 55 gallon container was discovered in the main parking lot of the Rampart Casino and fearing what could have been possibly a terrorist situation, firefighters sealed off a large area, shutting down Rampart Boulevard and Summerlin Parkway. News 3 Steve Krupe is live on that scene tonight. And Steve, it appears that drum was filled with gasoline. That is right, Jim. I'm standing in the actual parking spot where they discovered this mysterious barrel. And from the very beginning, it was obvious it did not belong here. Right out there is Rampart Boulevard, just one of the streets that was shut down as extraordinary precautions were taken while they looked at that drum to figure out what was inside. All by itself in the corner of the Rampart Casino's front parking lot, this lonely blue drum certainly disrupted the daily routine for a whole lot of people. There were massive traffic backups as cars were detoured away from the scene. Even Sky 3 was asked to leave the airspace amid fears that an explosion could send debris high above. Initially, the call came in that the drum smelled uh, of gas. Now, there's no markings on the drum. And we said if there was gasoline in there and it was a device we, we didn't know, and it exploded, it would have created a, a, a pretty large fireball that could have hurt people on the bridge and on the highway. So that's why we did close it down until we were sure that there was no hazard to those roadways. Dozens of customers and employees of the Rampart Casino who had parked their cars near the hazmat scene had to wait for hours before they could leave. I wasn't able to get out to my car because they wouldn't let anyone start their ignition. Finally, it was determined the barrel was not any type of explosive device, and so it was carefully packed up and then hauled away for further testing. But firefighters do at this point believe that that liquid inside the barrel was simply gasoline and that it was just dumped out here by somebody who wanted to get rid of it. Reporting live, I'm Steve Krupe. Jim, back to you. All right, Steve, thank you. Now we're going to take you just a little bit further down the parkway and down 95. If you're looking for a bright side to all this nasty wind we've had today, here's one. It's going to be easier to get around the west side of town tonight. The strong winds are forcing NDOT crews to temporarily postpone the closure at US 95 and Decatur that we told you about last night. But the construction will resume tomorrow night, so you want to plan ahead for that. NDOT is closing US 95 at Decatur to move some big girders into place for the new bridge there. We're told uh, they are narrowing the lanes right now, but you can still get through. Uh, traffic won't be too bad for the westbound traffic when this closure actually happens, probably tomorrow night. Lanes will merge to use the ramps for a smooth ride over the top, but it's a little trickier heading east. That's because the ramps aren't quite lined up. Drivers have to make a zigzag on Decatur to get through. Show you a live picture now of the area we are talking about. And as you can see, as I said, you're able to get through, but uh, the freeway goes from three lanes down to two, down to one in some areas, so it's slow going. NDOT says you can expect closures from 10 tomorrow night until 5 in the morning. Now, if they were going to be working tonight, they were hoping to finish the job by Saturday, so they wouldn't need to close it over the weekend. But tonight's wind delays could mean more closures this weekend, and we'll keep you posted on that. A strange odor forced the evacuation of a local private school today. 11 students and three teachers complained of headaches and having a metal taste in their mouths. Hazmat crews were called out to the American Heritage School near Lamb and Sahara around 10 this morning. The spokesman for the Clark County Fire Department tells us someone was working on a gas line at the school to see if it would hold gas when pressurized. Well, the line didn't hold, sending gas into the area where teachers and students were, making them feel sick. All of the students and teachers said they did feel better once they got outside the school and could breathe fresh air. Southwest Gas is now fixing that line. An 11 year old girl spends most of her time now in the burn unit at UMC. She says a classmate of hers is bullying her and dropped a lit firework into her hooded jacket. That firework shot out a flame that severely burned her neck and back.
The boy who's accused of the prank is now charged with assault with a deadly weapon. Before Ben Correa went out on that breaking news for us, he talked to this little girl, and he reports now that this case shines a light on a growing problem, school bullies, and how far some go to pick on other kids. What's she doing now? She's going to put the yellow stuff back on it. What yellow stuff? The one that makes it not stick. There are lots of tears inside this room at UMC's burn unit. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. She's got it to get this off there, baby. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Bandages cover a skin graft on Samantha Valentine's neck. All part of the healing process for the 11 year old after a boy from school attacked her with a lit firework that landed in the hood of her sweatshirt. But I heard spinning and I was like, stat. And then, like, five minutes later, I felt like my skin burning. I was like, oh no. And then I just dropped to the floor and started rolling. I was trying to knock it out and I burnt my finger. She looked like somebody blew her up from behind, basically. Her hair was hanging, strand was hanging all the way down to her, her hip here. Her clothes were kind of smoky looking. She was black. She, she, felt like she was a mess. Yeah. Her mom believes the damage from the bully may be permanent. Hair that may not grow back and emotional scars that will take a while to heal. Now the family is speaking out, hoping their story will help encourage children to tell on bullies. Kids think when they tell on somebody, it's snitching. And I'm trying to let them know that it's not snitching. It's actually preventing or saving somebody's life, maybe. Just take Ben Correa, News 3. There are three things you can do as a parent to help your child if he or she is being bullied. Teach your child to tell the bully to stop. Tell your child to be assertive rather than aggressive and encourage your child to report bullying to a trusted adult. The student that is accused of burning Samantha Valentine was taken to juvenile hall. As for Samantha, she hopes to go back to school very soon. Violence by kids against kids takes other forms as well. When it's a group doing the bullying, it's called hazing. A group of students is facing criminal charges tonight for a hazing incident that sent several girls to the hospital. And now we're hearing their parents could be in trouble too. This was the scene in Northbrook, Illinois on Sunday. It was a powder puff football game is how it started, but you can see it got out of control into this bizarre hazing ritual. A group of girls started punching, dumping paint on other students. Police have learned that alcohol probably contributed to all this and that parents may have supplied it. I think charges should be pursued to the fullest extent by both the law enforcement community and by the school. The high school used to sponsor that powder puff football game, but pulled out after it got too rough. Starting today, Metro police officers have different rules to follow when it comes to the treatment of suspects during traffic stops. The Crime Tracker 3 team looked into how changes in Metro's use of force policy will benefit both you and the officers. This new training video is designed to help officers determine what kind of force is appropriate when. One of Sheriff Bill Young's first priorities since taking office was to review Metro's policies and use of force topped his list. The biggest change in policy addresses handcuffing suspects. Where this is really going to impact are those officers that maybe used a little too much discretion or officers that for whatever reason felt that they should be able to handcuff people anytime they felt they should. This change in policy also addresses non-lethal weapons, including tasers. Metro hopes to have every officer carrying tasers within the next few years. The hope is that tasers would cut down on the number of officer-involved shootings. Your friends and family in the Midwest are dealing with another severe storm tonight. This time a tornado touched down in Oklahoma City. It was just the latest in a string of twisters that have ripped across the Midwest this week. We have team coverage tonight. Dr. Jim Siebert is in the Weather Center to tell us how the same weather system that brought us strong winds today will impact the weather in the Midwest by the weekend. But well, we're going to start with Michelle Franzen, who is live for us in Pierce City, Missouri tonight. Michelle, appreciate the report. Now that area suffered some of the worst devastation. Well, that's exactly right. Good evening, Jim and Nina and the business district here in Pierce City, Missouri. Looks like a ghost town for many reasons, but it is the residents in Moore, Oklahoma, who are dealing with the brunt of Mother Nature tonight. A tornado swept through that area, injuring more than 100 people, 
damaging more than 1,500 homes and destroying more than 300 homes. A tornado a half mile wide tore through Moore, Oklahoma, a community outside Oklahoma City, at the height of the evening commute. And then I took off with him and we just crawled down right there in the, underneath them bushes and was out, hanging on the bottom of a tree branch. The twister spun across Interstate 240 and sliced through a semi and blew out the windows of a Greyhound bus. The tornado also leveled homes and commercial businesses and damaged a General Motors plant. Oklahoma's governor reassured residents the state is behind them. We'll rebuild GM, we'll rebuild Oklahoma City and more and Midwest City and the other communities in Oklahoma that were damaged tonight and we'll be stronger in the end. It is the latest in a series of devastating and deadly twisters that have carved a path through much of the heartland. The National Weather Service has logged more than 240 tornadoes nationwide since the beginning of May. In Pierce City, Missouri, residents and business owners promise to rebuild their downtown where nearly every building is either damaged or destroyed. Antique store owner Cindy Gitchell lost nearly everything in her business and home. It's just a horrible, horrible, chaotic mess. The whole town suffering. Many throughout the Midwest now faced with the daunting task of starting over. In Pierce City, Missouri, Michelle Franzen, NBC News. And more people keep getting added to that list. And uh, as residents here in Pierce City, Missouri had to clean up, now residents in Moore, Oklahoma will have to do the, do the same. It is the second tornado in four years to sweep through the Moore, Oklahoma area. The last one in 1999 was an F5 that killed 44 people and caused more than a billion dollars worth of damage. I'm Michelle Franzen in Pierce City, Missouri. Nina and Jim, back to you. Uh, Michelle, we're hearing from this end that more severe weather could be headed to that general area. Are people there clearing out or are they w staying there to, to stick this one out? Well, pretty much people have, have cleared out of this area of downtown and in the homes. Some people are in shelters, but uh, many people are taking cover in their homes and in other areas. And uh, they are waiting out the storm. They, uh, they are waiting out uh, the next round here. And this uh, is going to be a long night for some people who have been having a long week to begin with. Yeah, and a long night for you as well, Michelle. We appreciate the report. Dr. Jim Siebert continues our team coverage from the Weather Center. And Dr. Jim, as we've been saying, uh, you, you're watching, tracking these storm systems. It looks like maybe even more tornadoes could be sweeping through that area. That is exactly right. You remember the storm that brought us a little bit of rain on Tuesday and some wind? That's the same storm that's producing those tornadoes tonight, the same system. And today, the, the storm system that brought us wind advisories, by the Saturday, it's going to bring more severe weather and probably tornadoes once again to the Midwest. And let me show you why. As the storm systems pass us, we just don't have a lot of moisture in our atmosphere here. But as they move on to the east, you got all this nice warm moisture coming from the Gulf of Mexico, and it meets up with dry, cold air from the north. And so our, the storms that come through here get energized. They get more energy, and that's what's producing the tornadoes. Again, over the same spots because these storms just continue to move over the same area. Now, for us, it typically means a little bit of wind and some minor discomforts compared to major severe weather outbreaks like what we're seeing. Coming up in the forecast, we're going to talk about some nice changes in our forecast just in a few minutes. Jim and Nina. All right, we'll see you then. Thanks, Dr. Jim. With so many people ready to trade in their SUVs for smaller cars to save on gas, our News 3 investigators wondered why one government agency is going in the opposite direction. Investigator Darcy Spears is here with her continuing series, The Fleecing of Nevada. They've been called gas guzzlers, environmentally unsound, structurally unsafe, even tagged as helping terrorists. Sport utility vehicles have gotten a bad rap recently, so why is every Henderson cop you see in an SUV? No one can make sense of the Henderson Police Department's decision to phase out their entire fleet of Ford Crown Victoria cruisers in favor of new Chevy Tahoe SUVs. I can tell you that about 80% of the police fleets in America are currently the Crown Victoria Police Interceptor. Tahoes cost more, they guzzle more gas, and according to the National Law Enforcement and Corrections Technology Center, they're not certified or even designed for high-speed or pursuit driving. I am personally not aware of, of any, any department that wants to make an SUV their primary patrol vehicle. Except Henderson. There's a lot of factors that they considered 
in doing that, not the least of which was room in the vehicles. Uh, you know, in today's society, it's not like we just, you know, grab our notebook and go out in the street anymore. We've got, you know, all kinds of protective gear. We've got uh, the defibrillators for, you know, heart problem patients. We've got less than lethal uh, munitions that they've trained us with, you know. Um, just a variety of things that, that take up space. So why else would Henderson need SUVs when others don't? Henderson on almost, on what three sides of us is bordered by desert. So, you know, we have all kinds of body calls and people in wrecks on their four wheelers and all kinds of stuff out there that we need to get to. But the Chevy Tahoe's Henderson bought are not four wheel drive. They're still much better suited for going over rocks and around in the desert. It just does not sound like it is a logical decision to turn every patrol vehicle into an SUV vehicle and it also sounds uh, extremely costly. Henderson police say a Crown Victoria sedan will cost taxpayers around $20,000 while the Chevy Tahoe two-wheel drives cost about $26,000. That's a difference of nearly $6,000 each and since they've bought 68 Tahoes over the last two years, taxpayers have laid out an extra almost $400,000. Cost isn't a concern for the Henderson cops. They say they'll get more longevity out of the Tahoes and think they can make up the price difference in resale value. At the very minimum, I'd say we're breaking even. Not when it comes to gas mileage. After testing three cars over three months, Henderson claims there's only half a mile per gallon difference between Crown Vicks and Tahoes. But the National Law Enforcement Center's vehicle evaluation program shows it's actually three times that, which means taxpayers are shelling out tens of thousands more each year to gas up these SUVs. And as for the safety concern over Tahoe's not being pursuit certified? It's a sizable safety concern. The, the fact that, that only three manufacturers will make one vehicle each that they will certify for high-speed emergency response tells you something about the, the mechanics of those vehicles and the, the liability. Concern, I mean, all the men and women drive these things, and we're the one who drive them, you know, so we're, we've been fine. The only other department that has an all Tahoe patrol fleet is the Beverly Hills Police Department in California. But theirs are the older models that were pursuit certified. They stopped purchasing Tahoes after 1999 because they were no longer modified for high speed erratic driving. Currently, the only sport utility vehicle certified for high-speed emergency response is the Humvee. However, Chevrolet is in the process of developing a pursuit-certified SUV. As promised, Dr. Jim back with us, and he was promising to tell us, look ahead toward the weekend, and you said it was news we'd, we'd want to hear. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's still going to be windy probably for the next 24 hours, but not as windy as it was today. That's good. So the worst of it for us is over. Let's take a look outside where the skies have been clear throughout the day, and even now we're looking at general clear skies and the winds are coming down in intensity mostly clear 57 the temperature southwest winds 21 miles an hour but it's still windy gusting to 25 but earlier in the day we had winds gusting over 40 miles an hour so it's definitely an improvement and I think tomorrow even though we are going to see wind it's just not going to be as strong here's a live look at our Wells Fargo weather net stations here in the valley and we're again looking at wind you see some single digits out there about 10 miles an hour here at our Channel 3 studios. And in Henderson, it is, we're looking at 12 mile an hour winds. Not nearly as bad as what we've been dealing with. Let's go ahead and take a look at those temperatures. It was a cool day today. We should be in the middle 80s or so. And we're, well, we didn't make that. And we're already in the 50s, like in East Las Vegas, 59 degrees, Spring Valley, 55 degrees, 61 out in Nellis Air Force Base. As we look at the rest of Southern Nevada, same sort of story. Temperatures are cool for this time of year. We're looking at 66 in Laughlin, 59 Boulder City, 62 out of Lake Mead, 27 Mount Charleston, 53 in Pahrump. You know that 61 in Overton is cool for this time of year. The official numbers today made it up to 71 degrees. That temperature is not so bad, but with the wind blowing the way that it was, it felt cooler than that. 85 would be average. 53 was our overnight low temperature and air quality moderate, but improving after this wind dies down. So is the dust. Pollen report, high tree, high weed, and high grass pollen. So we've not only suffering with a lot of allergies, all that pollen has been blowing around in the wind today. So here's our storm system. It is beginning to move away from us. It's going to pull on out to the north. Tomorrow we'll still see some winds kicking around behind the storm system. But overall, the farther away that storm gets, 
the less wind we're going to see. So at midnight tonight, still the winds coming from the southwest or so. As we move into the morning hours, the winds start to die down. The wind vectors get smaller. That means less wind, but we will still see winds present in the forecast for the next 24 hours. They'll just slowly drop out. By the end of the, by the weekend, I think we're going to be a lot better. 40, our, low, our high temperature for Mount Charleston for tomorrow. West winds 5 to 15, so probably not as much wind up around the mountain. Out of Lake Mead, lows in the 50s, highs in the 70s. West winds 10 to 20, maybe it gusts up to 25. And in Las Vegas tonight, clear skies, still kind of windy. Winds 25 to 35 miles an hour. 71, our high temperature tomorrow. West winds still in place. Your five-day forecast looking really good for the weekend. Mother's Day, 82 the high, less wind. So... Just hang in there, it won't be as windy. Yeah, when you see that pollen report, you're always kind of reassured, okay, that's why I'm stuffed, or that's why I'm Ugh. tired. And you can feel it's it. has been a bad day, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's you true. Really can. Thanks, Dr. Jim. It's a stunt that has parents outraged. Up next, a teenager jumps off a five-story building trying to land in a pool. But as you'll see, the stunt went horribly wrong. Fair warning before we get started on this next story. The video is very disturbing. You might want to just listen and not watch the TV for a few minutes. A teenager was trying to copy a stunt he saw on the MTV show Jackass by jumping off a five-story high building into a pool. He missed and hit the edge of the pool. Now here's the video of 17-year-old Paul Smith jumping off the roof. Again, he was five stories up. You can see he partially hit the water. He almost made it, but he hit the concrete along the edge of the pool with part of his body. Smith shattered both of his legs and has serious back injuries as well. Coming up in sports, Mitch has your NBA playoff action, including how one young prince became a king in the Motor City. And we'll have high school